October 1899, Britain went off to war to beat the Boers and secure South Africa for the empire. There were polo sticks and crates of champagne in the hold. They thought it would be over by Christmas. Soldiers of the Queen. No, I don't think they were hollow words at all. We revered the royalty in those days, uh, which is sadly absent at the present time. And I think a number of them thought that they were really fighting for the Queen and the Empire. The Boer War took the world into the 20th century and taught Britain a resounding lesson. The greatest empire ever needed nearly three years to beat a Boer army smaller than the population of Brighton. It became the first modern conflict, a guerrilla war of scorched earth, concentration camps. Blacks were both victims and protagonists and were condemned by the war to nearly a hundred years of oppression. It has cast a long shadow across the century. The Boer War was dominated by the land over which it was fought. A war which began with a simple, seemingly innocent aim. It's about freedom, nothing else. It's not about hating anyone. You just want your place in the sun. You want your rights. That's all it's about. Kent gij dat volk vol helden En toch zo lang in 1836, hundreds of farmers, or Boers, trekked from the British Cape Colony deep into South Africa. Of mostly Dutch descent, devout and determined, they sought new lands to settle and farm, as far from British rule as possible. Boer trekkers climbed a hill in Natal they called Spion Kop, Lookout Hill. They gazed across fertile country, believing they had an absolute right to it, as do their descendants. Do was here nie. There were no black tribes then. The black tribes, Zulus and others, moved down from the north. It's in the history books. There were no tribes. Any land we got in Natal was lawfully bought from the Zulu people. We never annexed any land. People got land or farms which were empty. But somebody was there first. This is our land, the land of the black people. The Boers came and found blacks here. And the English came and found blacks here. This world belongs to us blacks. The Boers did not agree. On the 16th of December, 1838, 12,000 Zulus attacked 470 Boers at Blood River. 
The Boers formed their wagons into a defensive ring, commemorated in this bronze replica. The Boers had guns and cannon. The Zulus had spears and shields. That day, the Boers killed 3,000 Zulus. I think that the idea of the Boers as a people was born at the Battle of Blood River. We say that God was with us at the Battle of Blood River. We prayed and said, you must help us because we will then dedicate this victory to you. The Boer victory at Blood River became the foundation stone of their belief not only in God, but in themselves as the natural rulers of the land and of its black peoples. The Boers saw us blacks as stupid people. We were not men to own land. That is why they took the land from us. The Boers considered us as fools. The Great Trek had been partly triggered by Britain abolishing slavery in its territories, including the Cape Colony. The Boers were determined to keep their slaves. As they took more land, their labor force grew. They paid the blacks a pittance, or just provided food, shelter, and sometimes alcohol. In the 1850s, the Boers founded their own republics, the Transvaal and Orange Free State. But this brought conflict with Britain. South Africa was of key strategic importance on the sea route to India, a vital piece in the imperial jigsaw. If you were to take any school maps at that time, you'd find the predominant colour there was red, a pinkish red, really. And that covered places like India, Canada, Australia, and we were extending our powers all the time. But we were, what should I say, it was a kind of beneficent theft. The Transvaal had briefly been a British colony, but broke free after the Boers won a short war against Britain in 1881. So this was unfinished business. Driving British ambitions in Africa was Cecil Rhodes. As Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, he had grand schemes for a modern empire. He planned to build a railway from the Cape to Cairo and to control the lands and their wealth between. The Transvaal and Orange Free State were of little interest as long as they just produced sheep and corn. But the discovery of gold changed everything. The Transvaal became the richest and potentially most powerful state in southern Africa. Britain now saw it as a political threat and an economic resource ripe for exploitation. Gold. 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 They found gold in our country. Gold. That's what, like. That's what they were after, the gluttons. Hold. Blacks were brought in from across southern Africa to work the mines, forced to live without their families in compounds. Their annual death rate was 20%. They had no rights. In the British Cape Colony, wealthier and educated blacks who owned land had the right to vote. Many saw Britain as likelier than the Boers to extend their rights. But in the Boer republics, blacks weren't even allowed to walk on the pavement. 
The Boers wanted us to work for them. They wanted to turn us into their slaves. They just made us suffer. They only wanted us to work. They made us suffer from our labors, forgetting that we are human beings too. The president of the Transvaal was Paul Kruger, veteran of the Great Trek. He believed God had put blacks on earth to serve the Boers. Blacks did not need political rights. But what about the 100,000 white English and Europeans drawn by gold to the Transvaal? Their labors had turned Johannesburg into a rich cosmopolitan city. They paid their taxes, but had no vote. My father said they should let them vote. They can't let them pay all the rates and taxes and not vote. But old Paul Kruger was afraid they'd vote him out of office. So he didn't give them the vote. Johannesburg, as it now is, was built by us. Yet you pass iniquitous laws denying us the ordinary rights of citizenship. Mr. President, we are here now seeking redress by constitutional methods. But if you persist in your attitude of blank refusal, you try us beyond endurance. Johannes Paul Kruger is my name. Johannesburg is my own town. And I feel towards it like a father whose daughter has been debauched by ropes and thieves. The interview is at an end. Cecil Rhodes, as usual, had a plan. Nothing less than to take the Transvaal by force. By the end of December 1895, he had 600 men led by his swashbuckling sidekick, Dr. Leander Starr Jameson. And in London, he had the ever-so-secret blessing of the British colonial secretary himself, Joseph Chamberlain. But Kruger knew about the Jameson raid in advance and waited till it had set off before striking. Message over the wires, Mr. President. Jameson has started. He's marching towards the border. I have my white horse brought to the door. You'll find it ready settled. Paul, is that it, sir? I'll be back in a few days. Fetch my boots. If you want to kill a tortoise, Kruger said, you must wait until it puts its head out. Jameson was ambushed and never reached Johannesburg. He lost 65 men and was led off weeping to prison. It became an international scandal. London pretended the Jameson raid was a rogue operation, but the Boers were not fooled. They used their gold to purchase an arsenal of the latest weapons from Europe. Krupp field guns and Mauser rifles from Germany. Cruzo siege guns from France. In June 1899, peace talks failed. Kruger felt increasingly threatened, but refused to compromise his country's independence. And Britain's negotiator with Kruger wouldn't have accepted a compromise anyway. Sir Alfred Milner wanted the Transvaal wrested away from stubborn conservative Boers like Kruger and placed firmly within the modern British Empire. With British troops at his border, Kruger decided to strike first. President Kruger knew how powerful the English were. He said, you do not want voting rights, you want my country. That is what the war was all about. They wanted our land. On the 11th of October, 1899, the Boers declared war on Great Britain and promptly besieged the towns of Mafeking, Kimberley and Ladysmith in the British Natal and Cape colonies. 
then it became real war. It had just been trouble brewing before that. And when the real war came, the Boers shut up, or they surrounded those towns and wanted to starve them out. Well, not being as highly civilized as we were, in their more rough way, when they got angry, they got a bit cruel. Using their new siege guns, the Boers shelled the towns, hitting hospitals, killing women and children. If British people are in trouble, the country's got to help them out. And if the British start a war, they've got to win. At 47,000 men, the British force wasn't huge, but they weren't expecting a huge war. Among the journalists was 24-year-old Winston Churchill. He was said to be both clever and bumptious. In command was General Sir Redvers Buller, VC, veteran of the Zulu War. He was filmed boarding ship in a tall hat, shaking hands. He said he hoped he wouldn't be away long. Goodbye, At last we have arrived. We sighted land at 8 a.m. The harbour was crowded with great transports, crowded with soldiers. There were 5,000 while we were there, and I don't know how many horses. And the wharves and sheds are piled with boxes of ammunition, biscuits, stores and hay. In fact, you have no idea of Britain's greatness till you see a place like this. We had five miles to walk through Cape Town, and it fairly took the starch out of some of us. From their open trucks, the ordinary soldiers, or Tommies, looked out at the strange land unfolding and wrote home about it. Corporal Harold Armstrong of the Kensingtons began to sense how hostile the environment was and how it favored the Boers. We're plagued by beetles, flies, and fleas. Frightful country for marching. The hills bristle with mounds of stone which would afford splendid shelter for marksmen. But at first, many officers treated the war as a hunting party. The Boers would be caught like pheasants in drives. Camouflage was unsporting. It would be a pushover, like wars they'd won against primitive tribesmen. They didn't think that it was going to last very long. They knew that the Boers were virtually farmers without any military training or anything like that, and that there wouldn't be very much opposition. And as a result, when the army arrived in South Africa, according to what my father told me, there was very little reconnaissance. Very often, I remember him saying that several officers would get together and they'd say, see that copy over there? Let's go and see if there's any boys up there. I tell you what, I'll race you there. And they'd charge off on their horses. And if the boys happened to be there, well then, of course, they got casualties. And then they realized that uh, there's more to the Boers than they'd thought. Op burgers op na die oorlogsveld, so weer klink die woord. To sien jy net commandos trek na oos, wees, suid en noord. The Boer republics mobilized over 30,000 men. They formed into commandos from each district. Sons joined with fathers. Whole families heeded the call to arms. 
Each man supplied his own horse and rifle. To skriele, voor en toe, voor en toe, hier kom die Engelse aan. Die bedoeling was om die Britse garnisoene... The idea was to defeat the British garrisons on the borders. Many set out full of courage, with slogans on their hats, Cape Town or Bust. Or cries like, we'll soon be eating bananas in Durban. The war will be over by Christmas. There was a feeling that a few quick victories and Britain will be willing to give us back our independence. It was an army quite unlike the British. The Boers were bound by common cause, but not by discipline. The men elected their officers and didn't have to obey them. The Boer is a strong individualist. Early in the war, an officer would often say, take that hill. He'd be talking to a commander of 150 men. Then 50 men would go and take the hill. The other 100 would go home, put their feet up, make coffee, cook a meal, saying, we'll catch up with you later. It was quite clear in the beginning of the war. I will make war, but on my terms. The Boers declared it a white man's war and promptly took their black servants with them. Perhaps 12,000 in all. Some went willingly. Others, like Paulie McQuenna's father, weren't given an option. Basquas Ras was not a man who liked a black person telling him what to do. He wanted to be the one to tell the black man what to do. If he told you to go with him, you couldn't say no. My father took his boss's horse when it was tired and rested it. He had to remove the saddles and polish and prepare them. Where the boss went, he went. He had to carry his gun for him and follow him to the front where the fighting was. That's how Mr. Kuzratz went to war. The British agreed it was a white man's war and then employed tens of thousands of blacks as ox drivers, laborers, scouts and spies. My father joined the British forces because he could be paid. He didn't have that political affiliations one way or the other. The Boers didn't have the money to pay them. And uh, the English had the money to pay them. And there were also uh, supplies of uh, food and all the rest of it. They were treated like soldiers, even though they were not soldiers. Six thousand miles from the war, eight-year-old Arthur Whitlock kept up with the British Army's progress across South Africa. I was able to follow the war more closely because the Daily Mail, they brought out a map and you had little flags with pins on them and you pinned them showing the position of the various troops. Arthur followed the movement of Lord Methuen with 8,000 men to relieve Kimberley and Mafeking, encircled by the Boers. General Buller, with 15,000, was off to relieve Ladysmith. But in their way stood the Boers, helped by the volunteer Irish Brigade. They leapt at the chance to strike a blow for the rights of small nations against the British oppressor. What they learned detonating railway lines in South Africa would later be put to use with the IRA. As well as blowing up bridges, the Boers ambushed trains, and armoured trains in particular.
On the 15th of November, 1899, Winston Churchill took a ride in one. The Guardian correspondent refused to go, saying Churchill would either see too little or too much. The Boers derailed the train here, at the foot of this hill. My grandfather was the medical officer on the armoured train. During this derailment, they came under fire from the ridge west of the railway line, uh, and the fire was pretty heavy, and they were wounded almost from the first. And Winston Churchill was on that armoured train. I can remember my grandfather saying that uh, he remembered Winston Churchill turning to his batman and saying, pass me my heavy revolver. <laughs> Churchill switched abruptly from journalist to leader of men. An intense fight followed, resulting in four dead, 14 wounded and 58 taken prisoner, including Winston Churchill. And then, on his way to prison in Pretoria, Churchill was treated to a lecture by his Boer guard, which suddenly made him see why the Boers opposed them so bitterly. They feared that the British in victory would give full equal rights to the blacks. Fancy letting the black folk walk on the pavement. Educate a Kaffir. Ah, that's you English all over. We educate them with a stick. They were put here by the God Almighty to work for us. Insist on their proper treatment, will you? We'll settle whether you English are to interfere with us before this war is over. 10th of December, 1899. British artillery pounded poor positions in the hills around the besieged towns. Hills like Margusfontein near Kimberley. After the heavy bombardment, it showed no signs of Boer life. So three and a half thousand men of the Highland Brigade prepared to capture it. It was a night attack in a thunderstorm. There had been no reconnaissance. Near the foot of the hill, they were hit by a tremendous volley of bullets. Some were killed, others panicked and ran. Most stuck it out. For the whole of the next day, the Highlanders lay on the plain without shelter from long-range Mausers or baking sun. But where were the Boers shooting from? To answer that question, Lord Methuen ordered an aerial reconnoitre. While the battle raged below, Captain Jones went up to look for the enemy. Filled balloon Titania made a sense for observing purposes for several hours. Saw Kimberley in the distance. But the Boer position was so well taken up that it was almost impossible to locate. But Captain Jones was looking in the wrong place. The Boers weren't on the hill at all. They were secure in a trench at its foot. The trench is still there. A century ago, Michael Heffer's father, Louis, lay behind it, picking off the Highland Brigade. After a day of slaughter, a truce was called. Michael remembers his father's words. I got up and walked over to where the Scottish troops were lying. Some had up to seven bullet holes through the head. I was very moved to see these young men. The reason was because there wasn't one old man there. They were all kids. My father saw an old Scottish minister walking amongst them, reading from a Bible. My father said it touched him deeply to see all the dead people, even though it was a big Boer victory. There were over 900 British casualties. 
the Black Watch and Seaforths bore the brunt. One Highlander said they had been taken into a butcher's shop and left there. A private in the Black Watch dictated a poem from his hospital bed. Why weren't we told of the trenches? Why weren't we told of the wire? Why attack in the quarter column? May Tommy Atkins inquire. Why were no scouts sent forward? Why were no scouts on our flank? Why were we marched up in column? Who made the mistake? Give his rank. Do they know his name in old England? Do they know his incompetence yet? Tommy has learned to his sorrow, and Tommy will never forget. They called it Black Week in Britain. There had been two other defeats in five days at Stormberg and Colenso. I realize by the actual news in the paper that uh, things weren't going too well. It was probably due to the lack of supplies and our fighting in an unknown country where those on the spot were very familiar with it. It was humiliating. No one alive in 1899 could remember a time when the British had been beaten so resoundingly. A century of certainty overturned by a bunch of foreign farmers. Lord Wolseley, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, was appalled. We are face to face with a serious national crisis, and unless we meet it boldly, it will lead to dangerous complications with foreign powers. But the foreigner's first instinct was to laugh. Queen Victoria had her own reply. We are not interested in the possibilities of defeat. But Boer response to trouncing Britain was strangely subdued. Buitlandse vrijwilligers is verstom dat die boere nie uitgelate is. Foreign volunteers fighting with the Boers were astounded that the Boers were not elated about these victories. But it was just part of God's plan. We are good shots with the help of God. This slogan, with the help of God, almost became a philosophy of life. So they accepted the victories and all was well. We have no problems. Christmas is coming and we might have peace in the near future. But there was no chance of peace. An atmosphere of defiant jingoism now ruled in Britain. While Queen Victoria cheered up the soldiers already in South Africa with a tin of chocolates each for Christmas, Lord Wolseley decided to double the army. The Imperial Volunteers were formed with gentlemen for the first time serving in the ranks. People now spoke of it as a national war. And after the failures of Buller and Methuen, new leaders were called for. Enter Field Marshal Lord Roberts of Kandahar and Lord Kitchener of Khartoum himself. I remember they used to sing a song Lord Roberts and Kitchener, General Buller and White, four of the bravest generals that ever went out to fight. And then it went on. And when the war is over, how happy we'll be, for I love Rosie O'Grady, and Rosie O'Grady loves me. On the 10th of January, 1900, Roberts landed in Cape Town as Commander-in-Chief over General Buller. In contrast with the patriotic optimism back home, Roberts had deep misgivings about the campaign. His only son, Freddie, had just been killed during Buller's failed bid to relieve Ladysmith. Buller was now just 16 miles from Ladysmith. Wary of chalking up another defeat, he put General Warren in temporary command. 
In between Warren and Ladysmith was a formidable range of hills. British mounted infantry scouting on the left flank stumbled on a clear route round the hills to Ladysmith. This would have averted the bloodiest battle of the whole war. But the British Army of 1900 was no place for initiative. Warren ordered these men back and decided to force straight through the hills. That meant capturing Spion Kop, the same vantage point from which the Voortrekkers had looked out 60 years before. One of the officers taking part in the operation was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Thornycroft. It was to be a surprise attack at night up this valley to Spion Kop beyond. But Thornycroft realized they would get hopelessly lost in the darkness. So he sat here at dusk and noting the landmarks ahead, drew a sketch map to guide them. A century on, Thornycroft's family brings a copy of the map back to Spion Kop. Ah, that's it. It's there And it's, it's wonderful. They show it to their guide, Gilbert so Torlagi. There was uh, a sandstone shelf down the side here, which is visible. Yes, the map enabled the assault force of 1,700 men to make their way up Spion Cop. Pitch dark night, but how many boys are here? Have they got artillery with them? No one knows. Orders were that they were to be absolutely silent. No talking, no smoking, no lights, no firing. And slowly, 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 they made their way up that spur. Private Matthew Kelly recalled the lengths they went to to ensure silence. All the dogs which are following us are destroyed. After marching for two or three hours, we are told quietly that we have passed the enemy sentries and are in their lines. Spion Kop itself was in fact only lightly guarded by the Boers. But they had reinforcements, including artillery, close at hand. And the British, having failed to reconnoitre Spion Kop, didn't know that just beyond it lay a semicircle of hills. Perfect positions for the Boers to bombard Spion Kop itself. A little after three in the morning, the British reached the grassy plateau which rises gradually to form the summit. Probably when they were somewhere in this area, yeah. suddenly out of the darkness came a tremendous challenge of beast R. Getting no response, the boys opened fire, the British charge forward, and they catch one of those boars, bayonet him and kill him. The rest of the boys ran away, and with that the British then gave three hurrahs to indicate to everybody that Spionkop had fallen into British hands. The British now dug themselves in. This row of stones marks the line of the trench. But the ground was rocky, and many picks and shovels had been abandoned on the long walk up. The trench was barely 18 inches deep. Enveloped in fog, the exhausted soldiers now snatched some rest. It wasn't until dawn that they realized just how dangerously close the Boer front line was. About 7 a.m. the sun breaks through the clouds and we see a long grassy ridge about a thousand yards in front, but commanding our ridge. About 8 a.m. the Boers open a terrific fire from every place except our extreme rear. We take the best cover we can get. Captain Birch gets shot in the head just above the eye. The fire is terrible. Ever so much heavier than what I had seen before or since. Yeah. 
Boer reinforcements now hurried up this slope behind the Boer lines. One of the newcomers was 17-year-old Denise Rates. Denise wrote an account of his war, which has been translated by his grandson, Michael. The mountain rose above us, as steep as a wall, and it was no easy climb, passing a trail of corpses on the way. Halfway to the top, I found Robbie Reinecke lying dead. When I reached the top of Spionkop, I discovered that the burghers had advanced no further than the first line of rocks, right on the rim of the plateau, and that the rest of the flat summit was still in the hands of the enemy. The nearest English were behind a long, low stone wall, no more than 30 yards away, from where they kept up a vicious fire on us with their Lee Metfords. The Boers now used a signaller on Spion Kop to direct their artillery fire precisely onto the British trench. The accuracy of the Boer gunners was devastating. Around nine in the morning, General Woodgate, the British officer commanding Spion Kop, was mortally wounded. A doom-laden message was sent by heliograph. Reinforce at once, or all lost. General dead. General Buller sensed the rising panic and sent an order to Warren. Unless you put some really good, hard fighting men in command on the top, you will lose the hill. I suggest Thornycroft. But it took hours for the message to reach Thornycroft, pinned down in this trench. No one knew who was in command and the situation was deteriorating. By about one o'clock, the suffering, the losses, was awful. It was hot, hot, hot. People were thirsty, people were tired, and there were still many, many hours of daylight ahead. Behind here lay many dead, many wounded, and there was no end in sight. This was a fatal spear on cop, and the sun pouring down. The shells dropping everywhere. You can see the poor chap shot down like skittle pins. The most awful scene of carnage. Men blown to atoms, joints torn asunder, headless bodies, trunks of bodies. Awful. Awful. Copy of letter from Colonel Thornycroft, Spear and Cop, to Sir Charles Warren, 2.30 p.m., 24th of January 1900. We are badly in need of water. There are many killed and wounded. If you really wish to make a certainty of the hill for the night, you must send more infantry and attack enemy's guns. But General Warren, two miles away in his camp, had no idea where exactly on Spion Cop his troops were. Fearing the British might get hit by their own artillery, he did not shell the enemy's guns. For their part, the Boers on Spion Kop were under such intense fire from Thornycroft's men that, ironically, they too felt they were losing the battle. The original Burgers, who had attacked early that morning, were holding on to the barren rock perimeter, all the while in the burning sun, under severe fire and unable to advance further. As a result, their courage started to weaken and imperceptibly, many began to slip down the hill. Meanwhile, relentless Boer artillery destroyed the British signalling position here, smashing the heliograph. No one had remembered to bring oil for the signal lamp. Thornycroft felt increasingly abandoned, while the generals dithered below. By sunset, the British were on their last legs. Regret to report that I have been obliged to abandon Spear and Cop, as the position has become untenable. I have withdrawn the troops in regular order and will come to report as soon as possible. Alex Thornycroft, Lieutenant Colonel. So he had taken an awesome responsibility, but I think he really had very little option. He knew he was going to get criticised because he wrote to his brother. That's why that is. And he said, I, I'm writing this letter in case anything happens to me. 
so that you will know exactly what happens. And he goes through all the reasons why he, he, he decided to do it. Yeah. So he knew he was going to get fired. Mm. As darkness fell, the British and Boers retreated down their sides of the hill, each believing the battle lost. But one man was actually climbing Spion Kop. Winston Churchill had daringly escaped from prison and joined the army. He was, he was sent, sent up to reassure Thornycroft that guns and men were on their way to urge Thornycroft to stay put. I found Colonel Thornycroft surrounded by the remnants of the regiment who had fought for him like lions and followed him like dogs. But the decision had already been taken, as he put it tersely. Better six good battalions safely down the hill than a mop-up in the morning. We woke with the falling of the dew, and as the sky lightened, to our utter surprise, we saw two men on the top triumphantly waving their hats and holding their rifles aloft. They were Boers. The English were gone, and the hill was still ours. We were soon hastening up the slope to the English breastworks to find them abandoned. In the shallow trenches where they had fought, the soldiers lay dead in swathes, and in places they were piled three deep. The Boers looted the British bodies, taking boots and even socks from the dead. Boer and British medical orderlies and gravediggers went to work. A Boer doctor was overheard to say, we Boers would not, could not suffer like that. There were around 1,500 casualties in all. Losses among the Lancashires were so heavy that a terrace at Liverpool's Anfield Road football stadium was called the Cop in remembrance. Spion Cop brutally confirmed all that was wrong with the British Army in 1900. No reconnaissance, poor communications, blundering leadership. Buller ordered a full retreat, caught on film. A 19th century army would have to learn how to fight a 20th century war against people fighting for their freedom. Next week on the Boer War, white life and black death in Mafeking. The British fight back and think they've won, but the Boers turn the war into the first guerrilla conflict of the 20th century, and the farm burnings and roundups begin. Britain had suffered a run of defeats in the opening months of the Boer War. As 1900 progressed, the tide seemed to turn in their favour. But the war was changing, not ending. It was increasingly a war against civilians.
Britain had gone to war in October 1899 to beat the Boers and secure South Africa for the empire. It was now the largest army to leave Britain's shores since Agincourt. The aim was to sweep up from the Cape, overrun the Orange Free State capital of Bloemfontein, and then into the Transvaal to Pretoria. But from the start, the Boers had besieged British garrisons in Kimberley, Ladysmith and Mafeking. Now the British army was split up and bogged down, trying to break through to the besieged towns. South London schoolboy Arthur Whitlock followed the war closely. These sieges of the three main towns they impressed me very much by the way in which they were so stubborn, getting short of food, other supplies, and uh, they stood it out against all odds, really. And I thought that was a marvellous tribute to our British nature. Beyond the outer British lines of defence were the Boers, dug in on hill and veldt. Their huge siege guns lobbed shells into the towns. Lookouts watched for telltale puffs of smoke on the hills beyond and warned the inhabitants to take cover. Women and children fell victim to Boer shelling and rifle fire. The Boers were told the exact positions of the women's encampment, convent and hospital in Mafeking, so they could avoid them. But they were hit too often for it to be an accident. The Boers became known as women slayers. Colonel Robert Baden-Powell was in charge at Mafeking. He sent an official complaint to the Boer general, which prophetically anticipated the course the war was to take. You have altered the usual conditions of war. You are making it one of people against people in which women are considered as belligerents. I warn you that the consequence of this may shortly be very serious to your own people. One of the dangers the British faced in the besieged towns was low morale. During the siege, people were cooped up all the time, but it was a gentleman's war because they had a truce on Sunday. They didn't fight on Sunday. And so on those Sundays, they used to have cricket matches and tent pegging. But in the Masonic Lodge, my mother said that they used to do all the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. I was very good at that sort of thing. And those, those people had very good voices, singing all the old songs. But that has how they, and of course, he was very good at putting on a turn himself, just a man of many parts. He was a master of bluff. He had to be because his defenders of Mafeking were very few and they had very little equipment. And one of the stories that is told is the defence round their forts wasn't very good, so they had the bright idea of putting up barbed wire fences which didn't exist. They planted some poles and everybody who approached had to step over the barbed wire, which they did solemnly, stepping over nothing. For my military knowledge, though I'm plucky and adventuring, has only been brought down to the beginning of the century, but still in matters vegetable, animal and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> I think there's that sort of inner resilience amongst the British people 
And when we're in time of trouble and such like, we can very often laugh ourselves out of it, where other nations, they can't understand that we are laughing at ourselves and saying, well, uh, we're a dog's body, but let's get on with it. And eventually we fight our way through. Baden-Powell's strict censorship and relentless self-publicity have conspired to give an impression that the sieges were an exclusively white experience, depending on bulldog grit and resourcefulness. In fact, blacks outnumbered whites by five to one here in Mafeking. In Kimberley, 10,000 black diamond workers were penned up in compounds. There were several thousand Indians in Ladysmith all caught up in a war not of their making and suffering for it. Very few had bomb shelters. My grandmother and my mother had no protection. Shelter for them meant leaving their houses and hiding behind a mound of earth or under trees. They lay flat on the ground, my mother with a baby on her back, and the shells flew over their heads and landed on their houses. One of the best chroniclers of the siege lived here in the heart of Mafeking's black community. He was a member of the Baralong people. 23 years old, he spoke eight languages and worked as the court interpreter. His name was Sol Plaki. Later a founding father of the African National Congress, he kept a diary from which his grandson reads. It's now Thursday, the 7th of December, 1899. The first shell of this morning burst near one of the railway cottages and killed a young fellow by blowing off his belly and pitching his intestines onto the opposite roof. I have never before realized so keenly that I am walking on the brink of the grave. Boer shelling killed and maimed more blacks than whites because the whites had shelters, which the blacks had to build for them. Racial discrimination was a fact of life then. On the eve of the war, a troop called Savage South Africa had visited England to perform scenes from past battles with Britain. Oh, they were just niggers. We had nothing against them, but they were niggers, and we used to say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, cut the nigger by the toe. If he squeals, let him go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, when we wanted to say who had to be it, if you know what being it is. They reenacted the defeat of the Matabele. We didn't mean any harm. We were quite pleased to think about the niggers. They were more than a pleasant thought for Baden-Powell. Desperately short of soldiers in Mafeking, he armed the blacks, breaking both the Boer and British taboo. The Boers felt that it would be wrong to involve blacks in this war. So did Sir Alfred Milner. He felt it would be bad policy to involve blacks in this war because the effect on a post-war situation would be tremendous, with claims for more territory and for the general right to vote. And for the Boers, it was a case of, this is our war, it has nothing to do with the black man. Boer General Piet Cronier wrote to Baden-Powell in protest. You have committed an enormous act of wickedness. Reconsider the matter, even if it cost you the loss of Mafeking. Disarm your blacks and thereby act the part of a white man in a white man's war. In fact, General Cronier himself armed blacks during the siege of Mafeking. 
Blacks also acted as couriers, with messages hidden in their clothes. The penalty of court was death. The British even had a black woman courier. My grandmother was a brave person. She was well known for her bravery. That's why the English chose her to carry secret messages. She carried a letter sewn inside her dress to an English outpost. The blacks fought the Boers and raided their cattle. They took the land's share of the risks, the whites got the land's share of the food. Ironically, much of the food belonged to the blacks in the first place. Baden Powell commandeered it and then sold it back to them as rations. The natives are getting a little suspicious of us. They want to know why we are trying to take all the grain from them. A man in Mafeking is sentenced to death for stealing a goat. Under Baden Powell, blacks were flogged for the first two offences and executed for the third. Standing at the back, the court interpreter, Sol Plaki. We have very great difficulty in feeding the natives. I saw horse flesh for the first time being treated as human foodstuff. It looked like meat with nothing unusual about it. But when they found that there was no more meat left and brought the heads and feet, I was moved to see their long ears and bald heads. And those were the things the people are to feed on. The recipients, however, were all very pleased to get these heads and they ate them nearly raw. Horse was a key ingredient in the black soup kitchens, as Ina Cowan noted in her diary. An old horse is slaughtered, skinned, and thrown into a huge boiler with some villainous mealy meal and salt, and is doled out at threepence a pint. J. E. Neely of the Pall Mall Gazette described the queues of blacks. Five or six hundred of both sexes and all ages, a waiting turn to crawl painfully up to the soup kitchen. It was one of the most heart-rending sights I have ever witnessed. As they lost weight, their eyes bulged out of their sockets. My grandmother said that to supplement this soup, they went to the river and ate mud to give them something more in the stomach. My mother said they had a little fox terrier. Her name was Vicky. And she was a miniature fox terrier, which they used to have to hide because as food got scarce and scarcer, if the Africans particularly got hold of a dog. I mean, it didn't last very long. They killed it to eat. So every, everybody was always looking after Vicky and hiding her so nobody would take her to eat. To make the food last, Baden-Powell had one more trick. Expel all blacks not essential to Mafeking's defence. Stocks at present will last to June the 12th. But by forcing natives away, we can get their share for whites. Tonight, no fewer than 750 natives have to walk 100 miles through Boer lines. Our outposts have orders to shoot at them if they return. It does seem hard. When a start was made from the river, there arose cries of Mama, Mama, children shouting after their mothers and women after their children. The Boers caught stripped and flogged many of the women. Some they killed. Those who got past the Boers faced a slower death, as J. Neely witnessed. 
I saw them lie where they had fallen, too weak to go on their way, mostly little boys. Probably hundreds died from starvation, or the diseases that always accompany famine. The British Army had been inching closer to the three besieged towns. On the 15th of February 1900, Kimberley was relieved. The breakthrough had begun. Poor General Piet Cronier, with 5,000 men, fell back in retreat from Kimberley. They had huge ox trains, heavily dependent on black labor. The main trade that the men undertook at the time was to transport with their beautiful wagons. And my father was a teenager, and his job was to be doleer. That is the man who leads the oxen. And it is this wagon which was chosen to carry the wife of General Cronier. Hester Cronier accompanied her husband. They were attacked by the British. Shots were coming from all sides. And down they would hit the oxen in their run. And says the way you would know that an ox has been hit would be when it fell on its knees and it made the sound, oh, and fell down. And his uncle would come with a sharp knife and cut off the straw, that is the, the leather cord that holds the yoke to the neck. And they would leave the ox there and run on until the next one is hit and the same thing would happen. And that is how my father contributed to the Boer, to the Boer War, saved General Grunge's wife. He never told us that the Grangiers came to say thank you for that. But Mrs. Cronier was only safe for a moment. Instead of fleeing to the north, her husband decided to dig his 5,000 men in along the banks of the river Modder at Paderberg. But 15,000 British soldiers were hard on his heels. It was now the Boers' turn to be surrounded. Boer General Christian de Vett implored Cronier to break out, but he was too encumbered with baggage wagons and families to risk it. Rena Villian's father was with de Vett. My father, said that My father told us they'd sent a message to Cronier telling him that they were going to drive a safe corridor through the English lines. And the minute they'd done that, Cronier and his men must flee down it. He shouldn't take any wagons with him, just troops on horseback, and they had to move as fast as possible. But Cronier didn't react. When the safe passage was created, he just stayed put. De Vett and the other Boers were miserable because the whole commander of the Orange Free State was captured there. And after that, the Boer troops were very disheartened. Cronier surrendered to Field Marshal Lord Roberts on the 27th of February 1900. It was the first major British victory and a turning point in the war. Over 4,000 Boers were taken prisoner, a devastating blow. Of dare bange vlinder Cronier was filmed peering out of the cart taking him into captivity. A tortel duif se sange With his wife and army, Cronier was exiled to the island of St Helena following in Napoleon's footsteps. A wiki fa 
Punch showed him greeting Napoleon's ghost with the words, same enemy, sire, same result. Cronje and Hester lived out the war on St. Helena. They then went to America, where he reenacted the Battle of Paderberg at the 1904 St. Louis World Fair. He died hated by his people. The British breakthrough gathered momentum. In Natal, they relieved Ladysmith. They pushed the Boers back at Trefontaine on the Western Front. When the British reached this final ridge, they saw the Boers fleeing on horseback on the way clear to Bloemfontein, capital of the Orange Free State. The city fell without a fight on the 13th of March, 1900. Yet a thousand would die here, but not from Boer guns. And the seeds of the tragedy were sown weeks, even months before. I know my father said that some of the water that he had to drink during the campaign would be absolutely horrified. Contaminated by dead animals and all that sort of thing. Disease was a major problem. They were having to drink untreated water virtually from day to day and from stream to stream. So it was never the same water uh, and hence there was a far greater uh, chance of picking up something from the water. Typhoid is one of the gastrointestinal diseases. It is an organism that affects the gut. It is characteristic of large standing armies. Spread by water, by food, by dust, by flies of which there were millions. For months, thousands of British troops had been living along the River Modder, swimming in it, washing in it, drinking it. At Paderberg, a thousand dead horses and cattle had been carried away down it. The water was alive with typhoid. Warnings were given and ignored. It's hot, it's dry, it's dusty. It's very hot, and they've marched, and they're thirsty. Who now has the inclination to ladle out a bit of water, boil it, have it cooled, and then drink it? It just doesn't happen. So that by the time they move, that army is incubating typhoid. They come as victors into Bloemfontein, and then the typhoid strikes them. And they died miserably. They really did. Feverish, dehydrated, diarrhea, delirious. It was not pleasant. It is not a kind disease. George Graham survived a bout of typhoid, then called enteric and wrote home about conditions in hospital. Some of the men have great blowflies alight upon them, and these rapidly turn into maggots. And one poor fellow was unlikely to recover, for he had nearly a pailful taken away from him. They lay their eggs upon our blankets, and you can tell the rest. There were severe shortages, but General Kitchener told one doctor you want pills and I want bullets, and bullets come first. There was indifference at the top and bureaucracy in the middle, so the men died. Nurse Kate Driver worked in Ladysmith, where the death toll reached 400. He lay quietly, in great pain. Oh, my little nursey, I'm a goner, he said. I could see, too, that he was a goner. I tried to persuade him otherwise, and tried to get knowledge of his relations. In case I kicked the bucket, he said, looking at me. I could not tell him yes. Two-thirds of the British soldiers who lost their lives in the Boer War died not of wounds, but disease.
Four days after Bloemfontein fell, the Boer leaders met to work out a new way forward. The ideas of younger generals, like Christian de Vett, Kurs de la Rey, and Louis Botta now emerged. No more fighting the British head-on in pitched battles. No more cumbersome baggage trains. The future lay in mobile units, raiding behind British lines. A guerrilla war. Fresh life was breathed into the Boer struggle, inspiring a new generation of officers like Marnie Moritz. The general my father spoke most about was de la Rey, whom he fought under for quite a time. He always said to me, if I had to name a great warrior, it would be General de la Rey. He used to go into battle with this great nose, hooked like an eagle's beak, and his beard blowing in the wind. He could inspire any man to go to war. The trouble was, disillusioned Boers had been drifting home following the recent run of defeats. And many more accepted a British offer of amnesty, as long as they swore allegiance to the crown and gave up their weapons. Johannes Swanepoel did just that, and was branded a traitor, or joiner, as his nephew recalls. My uncle became a joiner, and you can understand it from his point of view. He saw they had no hope of winning the war once the English had conquered our capital, Bloemfontein. He and others came to the conclusion that it was time to end the war. That's why he became a joiner. He also wanted to return to his farm. He didn't want to fight anymore. General de Vett realized he had to sort out the committed from the waverers in his ranks. De Vett told his men, go home to your farms. Sort everything out there and meet me again at Sand River. That way, only the ones who really wanted to fight would return. And that was precisely what happened. On the 25th of March, de Vett was rejoined by a group of burghers with the real courage to go on. And that was de Vett's whole idea. Give me a hundred men who want to fight, rather than a thousand who aren't interested in defending their own freedom. On the 24th of April 1900, HMS Powerful brought the survivors of the Ladysmith siege home to a hero's welcome. As these various places were relieved, there was a great response of the people here, but I think most of all it was when we came to the final one of Mafeking, when there was a tremendous outcry of joy amongst the people there. The relief of Mafeking, oh, that was a happy night in Glasgow. My mother said, the whole theatre in that night just emptied at once. And he's, everybody run to the public house for a drink. They were, they were that happy to know that, that there would be some men come home from Mafeking. It was a time of very great rejoicing. And we thought we'd turn the corner then. The British army now rolled into the Transvaal, beckoned by its twin prizes the capital Pretoria and the gold mines of Johannesburg. Crossing 300 miles of veldt was tough on men and their mounts. But the infantrymen, or Tommies, had the worst of it. Kipling uh, brought out a poem and it had particular reference to the marching. And it came on the lines of boots, 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 moving up and down again. There's no discharge in the war. We'll put, 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 slogging over Africa. Put, 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 slogging over Africa. Boots, 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 moving up and down again. There's no discharge in the war. The ordinary soldiers won the respect of officers like Captain March Phillips. 
sit down by this group of Tommies by the waterhole in the midday halt. They are tired and hungry and footsore. You thought you were roughing it. But look at these men. Look at their unaffected cheeriness. We can kick out hunger, thirst or weariness, but not, 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 not the chronic sight of them. Boots, 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 moving up and down again. The soldiers start in the war. The British Army, like a plague of locusts, left a trail of devastation across South Africa. On one level, it was a simple case of hungry troops coming across well-stocked Boer farmhouses. If they went into a farm and the farm was empty, things like that, there were always chickens and, and ducks and animals and things around about, and then they would help themselves to that. Um, but there was nobody else to help themselves to that. I mean, if they didn't, somebody else would. I mean, and it wasn't just the officers, it was, I mean, everybody. But it went beyond stealing poultry as Captain Phillips observed. Looting is one of Tommy's perpetual joys. Not merely looting for profit, though I have seen Tommy's take possession of the most ridiculous things, with a vague idea of carting them home somehow, but looting for the sheer fun of the destruction. From early 1900, they burned farmhouses, particularly those owned by fighting Boers. Lord Roberts of Kandahar was not unduly concerned about this kind of behaviour. People who are fighting against us cannot expect that their property will be altogether respected. Scorched earth and reprisals were standard weapons of colonial warfare. In recent British conflicts, commanded by Lord Roberts and Lord Kitchener, Afghan villages had been burned, the Sudan plundered, people starved into submission. The British started to treat the Boers as just another kind of savage tribesman to be brought to heel. On the 5th of June 1900, the British moved unopposed into Pretoria, capital of the Transvaal. Amid the rejoicing, Captain March Phillips smelt a rat. It is generally considered rather a coup in war, I believe, to take the enemy's capital, isn't it? We keep on taking capitals, but I can't say it seems to make much difference. The Boers go on fighting after their loss, just as if nothing had happened. Indeed, Roberts made it easier for the Boers to carry on by giving their army 24 hours to get clear if the Boers left the Johannesburg gold mines intact. So the Boers escaped taking the last boxes of gold mined on the Rand. Punch magazine showed Paul Kruger fleeing from Pretoria with a fortune in his saddlebag. Rumours about Kruger's gold persist to the present day. The British wanted our gold and land, and um Paul's money. He went off with it. I know where that money is. They can shoot me dead. I'll never say where it is. The Boers retreated into the mountains of the eastern Transvaal, fighting a series of rearguard actions against the advancing British. Kruger was spirited over the border into Portuguese East Africa and safety. He next showed up on a whistle-stop tour of European capital cities, drumming up moral support for the Boers. The intervention they wanted was, we're not asking for military aid from France or Germany or anywhere. We just want you to send Britain a diplomatic note saying, Please give this bunch of Boers their freedom back. That's what they really want. Kruger got little more than cheers and sympathy. But the Boer cause was seen as increasingly fashionable in Europe. Images of brave Boers were used to sell meat sauce 
underwear, fizzy water, cocoa. By mid-1900, some Boers were fighting a guerrilla war. Christian de Vett destroyed lines of communication, hit British columns, then escaped into thin air. He frustrated the British in South Africa and fascinated them at home. Schoolboys in England collected cigarette cards of the Boer commandants. They prized one above all others. De Wet, to my mind, was a, a fly-by-night type of figure, and for that reason, young as I was, I admired him, although he was an enemy. And, as I say, he flitted from place to place, uh, causing damage to our troops, then away before we could retaliate. Here is the dapper General De Wet. He is very so dapper in Transvaal De Wet. In 1901, De Wet was the hero of a comic film shot on a hillside in Lancashire. The Boers celebrated his bravery in song. In August 1900, De Wet found himself trapped in the Transvaal with 250 men. Behind him, the British in full pursuit across this plain. In front of him, the Michalisberg Mountains, a barrier of rock between De Wet and freedom. Well, here we are on the terrain where General De Wet performed one of his most famous escapes during the Boer War. It was the 21st of August 1900, and it's not too far away from... Historians Franz Johann Pretorius and Ian Copley pick up De Wet's trail at the deceptively easy foot of the slope where De Wet performed this escape. They take two horses with them. A century ago, De Wet and his men had 250. The only way out was to go over the mountains. So De Wet approached an African, and this was one of the most famous conversations of the anglo boer War. And he said to him, is there a path over here? The man said, no, master, there's no path. And he said, but have people gone here before? He said, long ago. And De Wet asked him, but is it the road, the path of the baboons? The man said, yes, baboons, but not people. And De Wet said to his men, come on, men, where baboons can pass, we can pass too. We've got to pass, otherwise we'll be caught. De Wet gave his horses their last drink here. There is no more water until the far side of the mountain. Now we get into the top of the tree line, it gets more rough and stony than ever. Yes, yeah. uh, it's actually from here that they got off their horses and started climbing the mountain. You can see how difficult it is, at this, even at this stage of the climb, that the horses are quite having a struggle. Come on, come on. Come on, let's go back to the Free State. Come on, come on, come on. The horses didn't want to go any further. Their counterparts a century ago weren't given the choice. De Wet was a hard taskmaster. But the popular depictions of his escapes made it look like magic. Five o'clock on a winter's afternoon. Almost dark. And they reached the top. You know, the De Wet said he had climbed many mountains, but never before had he been so tired. But the exhaustion was, was rewarded by the lovely panorama that he had here to the south. That's an incredible view, isn't it? Yes. And the, the best of it all, there was no British soldier in sight. <laughs> There's this lovely story of this young boy selling picture postcards of General de Wet in London. And they were all in envelopes. And everybody was buying. And this one fellow came back and said, but look, my envelope is empty. There's nothing inside. 
the boy said, oh, General de Wet must have escaped again. <laughs> the British response to Boer guerrilla tactics went far beyond legitimate countermeasures. From June 1900, destruction of Boer property was widespread and ruthless. General Kelly Kenny had used the expression, lay waste, in an order, and was asked to define it. Destroy what you cannot eat. Burn all farmhouses. Search for hidden stores of ammunition and destroy what you find. As far as the options were concerned, something that keeps on rising in all these conversations about the scorched, scorched earth policy, it was a war. It was a total war. There was no option. I'm not concerned here with the morality of the war, who was to blame and who wasn't. But what I'm concerned about is, if you look at it from a military historian's point of view, it was a war. The aim was to win it. Captain March Phillips was with Remington's Tigers. They scouted ahead of the main army, plundering and destroying. Our course through the country is marked, as in prehistoric ages, by pillars of smoke by day and fire by night. We usually burn from six to a dozen farms a day. If the Boers have used the farm, if the owner is on commando, if the line within a certain distance has been blown up, we find that one reason or other generally covers pretty nearly every farm we come to. And so to save trouble, we burn the lot. Blacks fighting with the British were an integral part of these operations. My father did, in fact, join, shall I say, parties that burned houses and uh, robbed farms and all this of it. That's why in fact, it was lucrative business to join and uh, forage in this farmhouse and all, and set them on fire and uh, all that. It was part of the game, as it were. We take the boars and burn their houses, as simple as that. You call it whatever you can, and then uh, start holding on fire, because the idea was to avoid these boars having a place where to hide. That was the main thing. It was part of the war strategy. Many British, like Captain Bromley Davenport, felt little sympathy for the Boers. I burnt the farm in revenge. There was a woman there, very fat and unpardonably ugly. I had no pity for her at all. The women here are worse than the men and should be made to suffer with them. But Captain March Phillips felt distinctly uncomfortable the worst moment is when you come to the house. The people thought we had called for refreshments and one of the women went to get milk. Then we had to tell them we had come to burn the place down. I simply did not know which way to look. The old grandmother was very angry. She told me that though I was making a fine blaze now, it was nothing compared to the flames that I myself should be consumed in hereafter. The women cried, and the children stood by holding on to them and looking with large, frightened eyes at the burning house. They won't forget that sight. I'll bet a sovereign, not even when they grow up. Christina Nianaba hasn't forgotten, though a hundred years have passed. The little piglets, they just chopped in half killed some chickens and chased the others around. And then they set the house alight. I almost forgot. My mother said I was still in the house when they started to burn it. So she ran to go and grab me. My hair was singed by then. I was small. I said, yes, I was so dumb. I always say that's why I'm soft in the head. Then we went to the wagon with all our stuff. 
She could not climb up quickly enough. So the officer said, My mother said, Turn around, I'll kick you in your ass. I'm sorry, lady. I didn't know you could speak English. Then my mother got into the wagon and we went off to the camp. Roberts had started to sweep the families of Boers still fighting off the veldt into concentration camps. The deaths in these camps would reverberate around the world to Britain's shame. But that still lay in the future. Roberts thought the war was as good as over. Someone else could mop up. In December 1900, he went home to an earldom, promotion, and a hundred thousand pounds in cash. Troops also returned. The city imperial volunteers were welcomed as victors. There was a mass exodus too of war correspondents racing back to publish their Boer War bestsellers. But the Boers weren't writing their memoirs yet. A young Boer woman, Johanna Brandt, overheard an exhausted British soldier saying, thank God the war is over. She replied, Tommy Atkins, the war has just begun. The man chosen to mop up in South Africa was Kitchener, whose hardline methods only stiffened the resolve of those Boer men and women prepared to fight to the end. Things weren't too bad before, but with Kitchener, forget it. He was a murderer. Before, they left women on the farms. But with him, it was goodbye. Then everybody had to go. He had no qualms. How much innocent blood flowed here? How much? Next week on the Boer War, the British herd Boer families into the first concentration camps of the 20th century. Thousands, mostly children, die. And the Boers take the guerrilla war into the Cape, martyring the black leader, Abraham Esau.